The Preacher, the Preacher in Prayer by Ian Bounds, Chapter 2. Above all, he excelled in prayer. The humanness and the weight of the Spirit, the reverence and solemnity of his address and behavior, and the fewness and fullness of his words, have often struck even strangers with admiration, as they used to reach others with consolation. The most awful living reverent frame I ever felt or beheld, I must say, was his prayer. <clears throat> and truly, it was a testimony. He knew and lived nearer to the Lord than other men, for they that know him most will see most reason to approach him with reverence and fear. George William Penn on George Fox. The sweetest graces by a slight perversion may bear the bitter, bitterest fruit. The sun gives life, but sunstrokes are death. Preaching is to give life, it may kill. The preacher holds the keys. He may lock as well as unlock. Preaching is God's greatest institution for the planting and maturing of the spiritual life. When properly executed, its benefits are untold. When wrongly executed, no evil can exceed its damaging results. It is an easy matter to destroy the flock if the shepherd be unaware or the pasture be destroyed, easy to capture the citadel if the watchman be asleep, or the food and water be poisoned. Invested with such gracious, gracious prerogatives, exposed to so great evils, involving so many grave responsibilities, it would be a parody on the shrewdness of the devil and a libel on his character and reputation if he did not bring his master influences to adulterate the preacher and the preaching. In face of all this, the exclamatory um, interrogatory Paul, quote, who is sufficient for these things, unquote, is never out of order. Paul says, quote, our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Unquote. The true ministry is God-touched, God-enabled, and God-made. The Spirit of God is on the preacher in anointing power. The fruit of the Spirit is in his heart. The Spirit of God has visualized the man and the word. His preaching gives life. Gives life as the spring gives life. Gives life as the resurrection gives life. Gives ardent life as the summer gives ardent life. Gives fruitful life as the autumn gives fruitful life. The life-giving preacher is a man of God, whose heart is ever a thirst for God, whose soul is ever following hard after God, whose eye is single to God, and in whom by the power of God's Spirit the flesh and the world have been crucified, and his ministry is like the generous flood of a life-giving river. The preaching that kills is non-spiritual preaching. The ability of the preaching is not from God. Lower sources than God have given to its energy and stimulant. The spirit is not evident in the preacher nor his preaching. Many kinds of forces may be projected and stimulated by preaching that kills, but they are not spiritual forces. They may resemble spiritual forces, but they are only the shadow, the, con the counterfeit. Life they may seem to have, but the life is magnetized. The preaching that kills is the letter. Shapely and orderly it may be, but it is the letter still, the dry, husky letter, the empty, bald shell. The letter may have the germ of life in it, but it has no breath of spring to evoke it. Winter seeds, they are, as hard as the winter's soil, <clears throat> as icy as the winter, winter's air. No thawing nor germ terminating by them. The letter preaching has the truth. This letter preaching has the truth. But even divine truth has no life-giving energy alone. It may be energized by the Spirit with all God's forces at its back. 
Truth, unquickened by God's Spirit, deadens as much as, or more than, error. It may be the truth without admixture. But without the Spirit, its shade and touch are deadly. Its truth, error. Its light, darkness. The letter preaching is unctionless, neither mellowed nor oiled by the Spirit. There may be tears, but tears cannot run God's machinery. Tears may be but summer's breath on a snow-covered iceberg, nothing but surface slush. Feelings and earnestness there may be, but it is the emotion of the actor and the earnestness of the attorney. The preacher may feel from the kindling of his own sparks, the eloquent over his own um, exegesis earnest in delivering the product of his own brain. The professor may use up the place and imitate the fire of the apostle. Brains and nerves may serve the place and fend the work of God's spirit. And by these forces the letter may glow and sparkle like an illuminated text. But the glow and sparkle will be as barren of life as a field sown with pearls. The death-dealing element lies back of the words, back of the sermon, back of the occasion, back of the manner, back of the action. The great hindrance is in the preacher himself. He has not in himself the mighty life-creating forces. There may be no discount on his orthodox, honesty, cleanliness, or earnestness, but somehow the man, the inner man, in its secret place, has never broken down and surrendered to God. His inner life is not a great highway for the transmission of God's message, God's power. Somehow self and not God rules in the Holy of Holies. Somewhere, all unconscious to himself, some spiritual non-conductor has touched his inner being, and the divine current has been arrested. His inner being has never felt its thorough spiritual bankruptcy, its utter powerlessness, he has never learned to cry out with an ineffable cry of despair, self-despair, and self-helplessness till God's power and God's fire comes in and fills, purifies, empowers. Self-esteem, self-ability in some pernicious state, shape has deflamed and violated the temple which should be held sacred for God. Life-giving preaching costs the preacher much. Death to self, crucifixion to the world, the travail of his own soul. Crucified preaching only can give life. Crucified preaching can come only from a crucified man.